You did it. You agreed to run D&D &D for your friends. You are now the dungeon master and you have no idea what to do next. Sucks to be you. <laughs> Just kidding, just kidding. I love new Dungeon Masters. And today we're going to hook you up. I'll be going over 10 steps to prepare for your first D&D game. And honestly, most of these steps are things I still do, even as an experienced Dungeon Master. By the way, these are not in any particular order and many of them bleed together and happen simultaneously. Number one, prep the location. Where is your game taking place? In the Forgotten Realms, along the Sword Coast, in Eberron in a homebrew world you've been dreaming up and fleshing out. Whatever it is, you should know a little something about where the adventure takes place. And that's the trick here, really, knowing just enough. You just need to know details about the town the characters start in, a bit of the surrounding region, and the dungeon they delve into first. If you think you need to study up on the entire campaign setting and detail out your entire homebrew world, no, you don't. And good luck if you try. But information about the local region where the game starts is super important. Government structures, standing army, police, local customs, town layout, important buildings, services available, important or useful NPCs, bad guys or monsters in the area. These things and more are important considerations and things you should know. Not only are they likely to come up during the game, but having them in your head helps you set the tone and feel of the world as you run the game. Number two, prep the adventure. Whether you are running an adventure module like Into the Fae, which I highly recommend, or creating your own adventure, you need to have it ready to run. I know this seems like a non-brainer, but prep your first adventure. Know the background and central conflict. Know what the villain wants and the problem they're causing in the area. Know what your plot hook is going to be that prompts your players to go on that adventure and try to stop the villain. Know the dungeon or location the adventure takes place in and the various obstacles, traps, and monsters that occupy it. Study the map and various scenes that take place in the adventure. These are typically the different rooms and areas that make up the dungeon or location. My personal goal goal when preparing an adventure for a group is that I know the adventure well enough that I only need to refer to my notes from time to time during the game. But otherwise, my attention is focused on my players and the information I need to run the game is mostly in my head. But my notes are still extensive, don't get me wrong. It's just that I try to make them mostly for reference as I run the game. Now, if you're running an adventure module like Into the Fae, Preparing the adventure really just means studying up and taking notes on the chapter that describes the location where the first adventure takes place. However, if you're creating your own adventure, you also need to well, design and create the adventure. And if you need help with that, I have an entire playlist of videos titled D&D Adventure Creation that I'll place a link to down in the description. It walks through the various aspects of creating your own adventure. Also, I have live streams here on YouTube almost every week, and about once a month, one of the live streams is us literally creating a D&D adventure together. So if you want to get a high level idea of the process I use, feel free to join us for one of those live streams. You know what? In fact, this Friday is one of those adventure creation live streams. What do you know? It's almost like we plan these things. Oh, and a word of caution. Many wonderful, well-intending people may tell you that if you are running an adventure module, that you should read the entire module before running the game. And I'm gonna have to disagree with that. Have you seen how big some of those books are? Like, look at these things. These are, these are like, these are like two to 300 plus pages long. You, you're really gonna read the entire book? Now, of course you're gonna read the entire book eventually, but even if you did read the entire book before you ran the adventure module for your players, how much of that 300 pages do you really think you're going to retain? Especially when it might take two or three years to run the module with your players. Not much. But Luke, those people will say, you read the module to get a feel for the adventure as a whole, the plot, the situations, and the NPCs. And to that I say, well, most well-written adventure modules these days have background and summary information at the beginning that you can read to get an overview of the adventure. Module. So my suggestion to you, my dear new dungeon master, is to not worry about reading the whole module. Some people tend to like to leave advice on the internet that just makes them feel self-important and make you feel lost and confused. This might be a case of that. Lost, confused, and overwhelmed. I gotta read the whole module? And then you quit and you never even start being a dungeon master. 
don't quit. It's okay, you don't gotta read the whole module. It's not that big of a deal. Okay, okay, anyway, my point is, don't worry about reading the entire module. Just read enough, perhaps a first chapter or two, and then start running your game. And then begin reading your way through the module as you're running the game. It'll only take a month or two of trips to the throne and you'll be all set. The, the advantage to this method too is that it guarantees that a group has actually started to play the module before you spend the time and effort reading through the entire thing. Of course, unless you're reading through it because you enjoy reading through it, which is a thing and it's perfectly fine. Don't, if you enjoy reading it, just to read it and you're not sure if you're ever gonna run it for a group, that's fine. You, you, you have our permission to read the module. Stop freaking out on me. Not that you need my permission, I'm just a talking head on YouTube, you do what you want. By the way, if you're looking for fifth edition adventures that you can drag and drop into your game, I highly recommend Layer Magazine. Layer Magazine is a monthly publication that all DM Layer patrons get. It contains fifth edition adventures, maps designed for use on virtual tabletops, new monsters, traps, puzzles, villains, NPCs, patrons, and more. In addition to Layer Magazine, DM Layer patrons get to play D&D with me, hang out in monthly video calls, and lots of other cool perks. Learn more and become a DM Layer patron at the link below. Number three, prep the NPCs. As the dungeon master, it's your job to roleplay all the NPCs in the game world. That's right, all of them. Isn't that fun? Now, you need to know some basic stuff like NPC descriptions, locations, and occupations. However, even more importantly for you to be able to roleplay them well is for you to know their motivations and goals. That blacksmith might have dark hair and speak in a rough voice, but those details really don't help you roleplay him. Because remember, roleplaying is not speaking in a funny voice. Roleplaying is having a character or NPC do and say things that person would do based upon their background, motivations, and goals. Our blacksmith, for instance, has had numerous encounters with arrogant adventurers who think they own the world and can kill whomever they please. And he really just wants to ply his trade, make enough coin for his family to get by, and make it home alive to tuck his two kids into bed each night. Now knowing that will actually help you roleplay that blacksmith. A word of caution! Avoid the rabbit hole of over-prepping NPCs. First, you don't need to prep every NPC in the game world, or even in the town or region, just the major ones the characters are likely to encounter. Second, you don't need a crap ton of details about each NPC. Some dungeon masters write full-blown backstories for their NPCs, pages of information, get all pumped up for this awesome NPC they created, only to have the characters say two words to the NPC, decide they don't like her, and then walk away. And then the dungeon master goes off into the corner to cry because their players rejected their super amazing, wonderful NPC. Look, your players won't like every NPC you think they should. It's hit and miss. So prepare just enough information about important NPCs, improvise as needed, and then if your players fall in love with an NPC, or the NPC becomes really important and interacts frequently with the group, then flesh out the NPC more. This will save you lots of pain and sorrow. Trust me. Another useful exercise when preparing an NPC is to think through how the NPC might react to what the characters might say or do when they encounter them. This primes your mind for role-playing the NPC. Actual circumstances will probably be different when you run the game, but this exercise helps you get inside the NPC's head so you can better role-play them. I often do this prior to a game session and it basically looks like me talking to myself like an idiot. And usually I do it in whatever voice I'm planning to use for that NPC, which shifts me from looking like an idiot to looking like a completely crazy maniac. Yay. So, Luke, you look like a crazy maniac in all your YouTube videos, so what's the difference? Number four, prep the encounters. An encounter typically contains three elements. A place, some NPCs, often monsters, and a dramatic question. For instance, in the first room of the dungeon, there are three goblins standing guard. We have a place, the dungeon, and the NPCs, the goblins. The dramatic question here is, how do the characters get by the goblin guards? Some groups are going to try diplomacy or deception to get by without a fight. 
Other groups might just draw their swords and attack. Both are ways to answer that dramatic question, and there might be others too. Some encounters involve elements in place of NPCs or monsters, such as traps and puzzles. There is a long corridor full of blades slashing out of the walls. The dramatic question is, how do we get down the hallway without being chopped into lots of little pieces? So for each encounter in your adventure, flesh out these three elements. And if you're new to this, I recommend writing the dramatic question down. It's just too easy to assume that the objective of every encounter is just kill the bad guys when it isn't. Dramatic questions help you add depth to your encounters and open your mind to other options for resolving an encounter that your players might come up with. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, give me a thumbs up and leave a comment for the algorithm down below. Let YouTube know how much you can bench press and you know, that I don't completely suck. Or maybe that I do. Number five, prep the monsters. Now we know that adventures are essentially composed of a variety of encounters, and most of those encounters involve bad guys, monsters. So my suggestion is to consider preparing two things for the bad guys in an encounter. First, consider what the bad guys are going to do and say when the characters show up. Remember, monsters are NPCs too, with motivations and goals, so they don't just necessarily attack. In fact, in my games, I rarely have monsters just attack. Usually, I engage the characters in conversation first. So, you want to have that social interaction part of the encounter prepared a bit. Second, consider the tactics the monsters will use if the encounter turns into a combat, as 80% of all encounters in D&D usually do. And that, that's okay, by the way, because combat is lots of fun. The three orc warriors rush forward to engage the party in melee. The orc archer, from his perch high on the wall, begins shooting arrows at any characters who look like spellcasters. And the orc shaman casts spirit guardians and wades in just behind the orc warriors. Planning out just a little in advance, the tactics your monsters are going to use in a combat will make your fights a lot more engaging and fun at the game table. Because here's the thing, even though you paid $50 for that fancy adventure module, it's not going to give you much of this information. Most modules you buy just tell you that there are three orc warriors, one orc archer, and an orc shaman in the room. And that's about it. It's up to you to figure out the details. This has always been something that really annoyed me, by the way. Like, why can't these professionally written adventure modules give DMs some guidance on these matters? And that's exactly why in Layer Magazine, which DM Layer patrons get every month, we give encounter notes for almost every encounter in an adventure. These encounter notes give DMs running our adventures this information so that prepping for their game is that much easier. Also. For a deep dive on monster tactics, I highly recommend The Monsters Know What They're Doing by Keith Aman. It breaks down individual monsters and suggests how they would fight in a combat and what tactics they would use. I'll throw a link in the description for you because I'm, I'm nice like that, the links. I'm, I'm very generous with the links. Number six, prep your players. It doesn't do you much good if you are 100% ready to go as the dungeon master but your players aren't. Okay, well it does, but, but you still wanna get your players ready for the game too. There are three main things that come to mind for this. First, pitch the campaign premise to them and get buy-in. This means that you let them know an overview of what the campaign will be about without giving any spoilers. For years, the fey creatures inhabiting Pelview Grove to the north and Pelfell Bog to the east have not been a source of trouble though perhaps they were a shade too mischievous at times. That has now changed. Beset on all sides by a variety of issues, childish pranks gone wild, dwarves forced out of their own meadery, and farmers missing, the Airedale Guard is looking for help from local adventuring parties to set things right. And then make sure that sounds like something your players would like to play. The goal here is to ensure you are designing and running a game that your players will find fun. If you pitch a 20 level mega dungeon with a mad wizard at level 20 and your players groan, you might not want to run Dungeon the Mad Mage for them. Second, help them create their characters as needed. And third, set expectations for social etiquette and behavior for the gaming group. Now, most of these items are traditionally handled in a session zero, though I would say the campaign pitch could more easily be handled offline via email or something. And I do have a session zero video with more information if you're interested. I'll throw a link to that in the description. Again, we're very liberal with links here. Links are good, they're fun, click.
Number seven, prep the PCs. Okay, you're, you're not really creating the PCs or preparing the PCs or anything. That's your player's job, unless they need some help from you, of course. But what you do want to do is understand and be familiar with what your player's characters can do. That is, know their special abilities and spells, the game mechanics for them, and how they work in the game. Your players are going to be using those things all the time, so you kinda need to understand how they work. Now, you don't gotta have them memorized, but you should have a general idea of how they work. For instance, I know that Varus, a monk in my Curse of Strahd game, can shadow step up to 30 feet to a point he can see as a bonus action. At least I think that's how that works. Which actually leads me to a correlated point. This is probably one of the least important things for you to worry about right off the bat. If you're swamped and overwhelmed, this is the prep item I would cut first. It's on the list of nice to have because it probably won't necessarily break a game session. Unless you have a player who is clueless about how their PC abilities work or who is intentionally misrepresenting what their abilities do to gain an advantage in the game. Because there are players who do that, which means that you probably should know how their stuff works, how it really works, and not just what they tell you it does. Can you tell I've had players like that? Number eight, prep your DM tools. You gotta have all the stuff you need to run the game, right? Buy books you need. Player Handbook, Dungeon Master Guide, Monster Manual, and if you're running an adventure module, you probably wanna get that too. And one word for you, bookmarks. I have tons of sticky note bookmarks throughout my player handbook and dungeon master guide so I can quickly flip to parts I know will get referenced a lot. I also have extra sticky notes so I can create new bookmarks on the fly, such as in the monster manual to help with finding monsters. Dice, pencils, paper, yeah, you might need those. Get a DM screen that has the reference information you need on it. Now, the original 5e dungeon master screen was Rather pretty worthless, but the revised one has much better reference information on it, in my opinion. And the most important thing for your DM screen, too, is to have a list of random names on it. My list of random names is paper clipped to my DM screen and is, in fact, the only thing I reference on it. Because let me tell you, the first thing that a player is going to do when they meet a random NPC that you didn't prepare anything about is ask their name. And players get a certain joy in doing so because they know you don't know the name and you're just gonna be like woo name so they just kind of like yeah and there's only so many times you can say Jim Bob before it gets old if you're using miniatures get those selected and ready to go if you play online make sure the map and tokens are all set up and if you're new to the virtual tabletop of your choice such as roll 20 you're going to want to play around in there a bit and learn the functionality number nine prep the game session even though you've planned out the adventure you still need to prep the game session for me this usually is a list of events that will happen and things the character Characters are likely to do. For instance, a constable of the town guard approaches the PCs and asks for help. This is me delivering the plot hook for the adventure. Then the group travels north from town to the site of the dungeon, and there is one random encounter. This is me presuming my players are going to bite the plot hook and go on the adventure. Then the group delves into the dungeon, and again, I'm presuming a course of action my players will take. And we're probably not going to finish the entire dungeon in the game session, so I stop there. This is a mix of planning out events and and presuming that your players will do certain things. But here's the catch. You as the dungeon master mostly have control over the events that transpire, but you have little to no control over what the characters will do in response to them. Remember, you're designing situations, not writing a book. Your players control their characters, not you. So there is a good chance that what actually happens during the game session is going to deviate a bit from what you planned and prepared if you are allowing your players agency, which you should definitely do. So this is where you're gonna need to improvise. However, also remember that when improvising, you do not rise to the occasion, you fall to the highest level of preparation. In other words, the prep work you do will help you improvise. Now, I will say that as you run the game more, get better at delivering plot hooks and get to know your players, you'll get a lot better at predicting what your players are going to do, which will aid you when preparing the game session. And pro tip, it's not a bad idea to ask your players at the end of a game session, hey guys, what do you think you're gonna do next session? Go visit Granny Titchwillow and the White Knights, or go find those drow assassins you heard about. This will help me prep the next game session for you. So yeah, what do you think? Number 10, 
panic and send a group text to cancel the game. Okay, okay, don't do that. Instead, join my Discord server where there are thousands of other game masters more than willing to help you out or swing by one of my Q&A live streams where I can help answer any specific questions you might have. Click on the screen now to learn 15 things you should know before you run your first D&D game or to become a DM Layer patron, get an issue of Layer Magazine every month and play D&D with me. And until next time, best of luck with your D&D game. Yeah, no, no comments about bacon. Bacon!